Hello, this is Dr. LaVora Williams, and I am recording Put on the Whole Armor of Knowledge about the COVID-19 Vaccine. So my objectives today are to increase your understanding of the vaccine, explain the vaccine development, the benefits of it, but really not to talk you into taking the vaccine. Uh, because I don't tell my patients um, what to do regarding a treatment or a vaccine, but I try to provide them with the information that they need to make an informed decision. So I encourage you today as you listen to this presentation to keep an open mind and to lean on your faith to help you make a decision as to whether to, to vaccinate or not. So this presentation is going to provide an overview of the COVID vaccine, and it includes some anticipated questions that participants um, often ask me about the vaccine. So I'll start by just sharing my journey. So when the COVID vaccine uh, was first developed, in the quote box, that is my response. Hmm. I was having a conversation with my sister-in-law and I just said, well, you know what? I'm just going to wait and see, let others take this vaccine first and just see how they do. Then I will take it. Because at the end of the day, even though uh, I'm a PhD in nursing and I conduct research, I am a little black girl from Hopkinsville, Kentucky, from Hoptown. So that was my original reaction to the vaccine. But as I thought about it more and I realized that my patients will rely on me as a nurse uh, to answer questions regarding the vaccine and being the only healthcare provider in my family, that my family will also have questions. So for me, that moved me from this initial response to this one where I made the decision to have the vaccine. So I hope this presentation will also help you uh, give over this fear or concern that you have. I had to realize as a Christian that God did not give me the spirit of fear regarding a vaccine that I really needed to explore and unpack what it was that was causing me to be hesitant about it. So as I'm thinking, you know, am I going to take this vaccine or not? People were dying, not just in the United States, but across the world. A month ago, as you can see from this headline, there were 400,000 COVID-19 deaths. Yesterday, February the 19th, there were an additional 93,670 deaths related to the coronavirus. People say that when America gets a cold, Black people get pneumonia. And that's been the case with COVID-19. We know that Black people are infected one and a half times more. 22% of COVID cases are Blacks. Black people die from COVID at about three times the rates of others. And these deaths are unlike anything that I've seen before in my 35 years of nursing. You know, over oftentimes what's sad about COVID-19 is that the people don't die surrounded by family and loved ones. You know, they die in hospital beds alone. Most oftentimes when people contract COVID-19, their families end up calling the ambulance to come and get them. And oftentimes that ends up being the very last time they see their loved ones because once a person goes to the hospital with COVID, their families are not allowed to visit. And if in the case that they die, um, prayerfully they die holding the hands of a nurse or other healthcare provider, but oftentimes they die alone. Now, why is it that Black people are more infected? There are a lot of different reasons for that. Um, for one, um, 
Blacks more often than others are frontline workers, they're essential workers. They are the individuals that drive the bus. So they're being exposed to the public more, work in restaurants. Um, they're the people who are the grocery store clerks. Um, so these essential people to keep the world running are often people of color. So that means they're at more risk of being exposed to the virus. So why is it that they die more? Well, COVID-19 is associated, severe cases are associated with obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and often Blacks are more likely to have these conditions than others. So therefore, it puts them at greater risk of dying from the virus. Again, I had to think, you know, what is it um, that I need to know to make an informed decision? And yeah, I'm one of these people who like to take things apart and put them together again to understand um, how they work. So I had to go back to what I learned in nursing school about MNRA um, vaccines. So let's watch this little video uh, that will help increase our understanding of the vaccine development. So let's just unpack this, this video we just watched. So the takeaway from the video is that the vaccine teaches the body how to recognize the spike protein and that alerts the immune system to fight against this virus. So we've all seen the picture of the coronavirus. It has these spike proteins on it. So what happens is the body recognizes these spike proteins and it fights against these spike proteins. Now, unlike other vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccine does not use a dead virus. Therefore, it cannot cause the infection. The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines both use this MNRA platform uh, to develop the vaccine. So let's move on. So let's step back a little bit and just think about what is a clinical trial, because we've been hearing that these clinical trials were amazing and they've discovered um, this vaccine. So before a clinical trial even begins, it starts with the researchers writing out a protocol. It's kind of like a recipe. And that recipe describes exactly their plan to conduct this research. The protocol explains the intended length of the research, how many people, who can participate, what will be done to the people, what are the anticipated risks to the people. This plan is then reviewed by a review board 
who decides if the researchers have considered all of the potential risks to the participants and if the benefits outweighs the risk. So the results of a phase three clinical trial, that's what we're hearing about, but there are other phases. Phase one is, the big question is, is it safe? In phase one clinical trials, about 20 to 100 people are enrolled. Phase two asks, does it work? And what are the side effects for people with a certain condition? Usually several hundred people are enrolled in a phase two clinical trial. Phase three is what we're hearing about with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Phase three clinical trials are asking the question, is it safe and is it effective for people in general? Typically about 100 to a few hundred to a few thousand people are involved in a phase three clinical trial. Now, the phase three clinical trial is typically conducted in a randomized way. And what I mean by that is there are two groups. One group receives the vaccine. The other group receives a placebo, a sugar shot or a, a shot that's made of salt water. And then what the researchers are trying to determine is these people, both groups, go back out into the community and what they're trying to learn is of these two groups, which one gets more coronavirus infections, which one does it. And that's how they decide if the vaccine is effective or not. Phase four of a clinical trial, the big question is what are the long-term effects of this medicine, of this vaccine, in the case of the COVID vaccine. Thousands of people are enrolled in a phase four clinical trial. So let's move on. So how many people were in the clinical trial for Pfizer and Moderna? So most phase three clinical trials, as I just said, it has several hundreds to several thousands of people. For the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, there were 30,000 people in the Moderna. There were 44,000 people in the Pfizer trial. So that means there were more people in these clinical trials than are typically seen in clinical trials. Well, who were in them? Well, 37% of the Moderna participants were minorities and 10% were Black. And that's very similar for the Pfizer trial. Now, keep in mind that, you know, 10% enrollment for Blacks in a clinical trial is pretty good. Blacks only make up about 13% of the United States population. Now, let's pause for a moment to unpack that. So why is it important for clinical trials to be diverse? Now, the reason is to just think that it's not that God made Black people weaker than white people. Biologically, we're the same. We're all fearfully and wonderfully made, just like the scriptures tell us. However, because of the systems in this country, we have poorer health than others. So it's important for researchers when they're conduct conducting the study to try to include participants who look like the general population. That way, they can test the vaccine on people from all kinds of ages, medical conditions, et cetera. And we know that Black people have more obesity, more diabetes, more high blood pressure. So that's why it's important that they are represented in these clinical trials so that we can see if the vaccine affects them differently than other people who don't have these conditions. I hope that makes sense. For more information about exactly who were in the Pfizer and the Moderna trial, their ages, et cetera, all of that information is available on, the, on their web pages. So the effectiveness. So after this, this 
phase three clinical trials for the Pfizer and the Moderna, they found that 94 to 95% of the people had a decrease in severe illness, the people that is who received the vaccine. So in the Pfizer trial, 170 people who were participating in that clinical trial developed COVID-19. 162 of those people were people who received the placebo, the sugar pill. I mean, the sugar shot or the, the salt water shot versus eight people who actually received the vaccine. There was no differences in this uh, effectiveness related to age, related to gender, to re related to race or ethnicity. So what that means is whichever vaccine that you have an opportunity to get, if you decide to take the vaccine, take either one. They're both equally effective and equally safe. But how was it developed so fast still? You know, that's a big question. Now, as the video showed us, the, the process of developing these vaccines wasn't new. Now, the part that the scientists had to learn is we have this platform that uh, the MNRA process, but we need to make the coronavirus fit this platform. It's kind of like if you had a blender and you're trying to make, trying to find a blade to fit your blender. This blade doesn't fit, this blade doesn't fit. Oh, this one fits. Now, typically in research, scientists are working in isolation and they're trying to answer a research question. But because the coronavirus was a global pandemic, it was important that this process was done in a collaborative way. So the best minds across the world came together to develop these research studies for, to develop the vaccine. So no one was working alone. And as a result of that, the information, the roadblocks that were met in one trial was shared with the other trial so that they didn't make the use to meet the same roadblock, so to say. Another thing is that in order to make the coronavirus fit the blade, so to say, they had to use genetic coding. Now, Genetic coding, because of technology, now happens so much more faster. It used to take months to conduct a genetic code or to read it. Now it takes weeks, it takes days. So technology has improved. So that allowed for the vaccine to be developed more quickly. And then keep in mind that the government prepared, supported this financially. So what they did is once the scientists had gotten close to thinking that perhaps a vaccine was effective and safe, the government put some dollars behind go ahead and developing that vaccine or producing it. That way that once the data, the scientists had all the data to show that it was safe and effective, there wasn't this lag time in producing it. So as soon as Pfizer said it's safe, it's effective, and they received emergency use approval, then the government had already was able to release that vaccine so that it could, people could receive it within a matter of days. Another thing is that because people were so impacted by the pandemic, they were willing to volunteer because they wanted to help be a part of the solution to ending the pandemic. So the recruitment periods were shorter. People were lining up. They were really volunteering to be a part of the clinical trials for the vaccine development. And fortunately, but unfortunately, because the rates of coronavirus were so high, people were more likely to become infected. 
So remember what we said, that there were two groups. One group received the vaccine, one group received the sugar or, or saline solution. These two, both groups were sent back out into the public, back out into the community. In the community, the infection rates of COVID were so high that these people were exposed to the virus more quickly than if the infection rate were lower. So therefore, the scientists were able to see the response to their being exposed to see who got sick faster than they would have the infection rate been lower in the public. Yeah, but what about safety? Were there any shortcuts or political influence? There's been a lot of discussion and concern that the previous administration may have influenced the rate of vaccine production for political purposes. However, keep in mind that for large clinical trials such as this, that there's an independent data and safety monitoring board. This board is comprised of, of scientists who have expertise in the area, but they're not a part of the particular study. So their job is to review the data and to make sure if there were any concerns that they could be addressed and answer those concerns. During the trial, you all might recall that there was a lady who had a severe reaction to the vac vaccine. The review board stopped the trial. And that's exactly what the review board should have done. So when a review board stops a trial, what that does is that, that means no one else can receive the vaccine of the research participants. No one else can be enrolled until the review board investigates what happens and decides if it's safe to continue or not. In the case of that lady, the review board determined that she had a history of severe allergies and that her response was because she had that serious medical history of allergies. So in this instance, that showed that the review board did exactly what it was supposed to do in making sure that this clinical trial was safe and that the participants were protected as they were being involved with the study. But what are we hearing about all of these variants? You know, is the the vaccine even effective with all of these mutations or variants. Just know that mutations in, among viruses is common. Viruses mutate. Uh, we know that even with the flu vaccine. That's why we have to take a, a flu vaccine every year because the virus changes. So the concern with that is that as long as the longer the, the virus is in the public, people are being infected, the more chance it has to change, to mutate. So that's why it's so important to get the, the vaccine in the arms of people as soon as possible, because that will slow it from changing, from mutating. The data thus far shows that the current vaccines are effective against these mutations, but we don't know if these mutations are gonna cause scientists to have to go back and develop a booster for the vaccines or to somehow change the vaccine to address these mutations. But what's more important now is getting the current vaccine in the arms of as many people as possible. And that's gonna slow these vi this virus from mutating or changing. So who's eligible to take the vaccine? Anyone age 16 and older can take the, vac the Pfizer vaccine. And that's because the Pfizer clinical trial enrolled people who were 16 and older. Anyone age 18 and older can take the Moderna vaccine because the Moderna trial limited participants to age 18 and older. 
Should pregnant women get the vaccine? It depends. So pregnant women were not included in either of the clinical trials. So therefore, there's no clear recommendation regarding whether a pregnant woman should get vaccinated or not. But it really depends on her underlying illness. So let's say there's a pregnant woman who has a serious breathing problems. Let's say she has severe asthma or she has another severe condition. That means that if she does get infected with coronavirus, that she might have a severe illness. The data already shows that pregnant women, their pregnancies are complicated if they get coronavirus, or rather there's a higher risk of their having uh, complications with their pregnancy if they get coronavirus. So a woman who's pregnant now should have a discussion with her healthcare provider and make a decision between the two of them as to whether she should receive the vaccine or not. There have been some new trials that I heard about this week where they are including pregnant women and they're including children so that they can test the vaccine on these individuals. Also, in the Pfizer and Moderna trials, even though pregnancy was an exclusion to participate, some women became pregnant while they were in the trials and there were no adverse effects to their pregnancy from having been in the clinical trial and receiving the vaccine in the clinical trial and their pregnancy. So how quickly the larger community can receive the trial is, uh, can receive the vaccine is based on the phase that they in. So there are four phases. Right now we're currently in phase 1A people who are in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, healthcare providers are eligible to receive the vaccine. Who gets the vaccine and which phase they're in is based on their risk of exposure to coronavirus and the likelihood of their becoming severely ill if they're exposed. So that's why right now it's just people in nursing homes and healthcare providers. Phase 1B is anyone age 70 or older, first responders, teachers, and child care workers. 1C is people age 60 or above or anyone age 16 who has a high-risk condition such as asthma or some other serious medical condition. And all essential workers such as people who work in a grocery store, drive the bus, etc. Phase 2 is anyone age 40 or older. Phase three is anyone age 16 or older for the Pfizer trial, trial. And phase four is children under the age of 16 once the vaccine becomes approved for them. Right now, the vaccine is not approved for children. It's unclear when the next phase will begin. Right now, there's limited availability of the vaccine. So that really limits how quickly uh, the progression through these different phases. So what matters now is that you decide whether you're gonna take the vaccine or not, because once your chance, your opportunity or your turn comes up, you wanna be prepared to, to go ahead and register because you don't wanna miss your opportunity because if you miss that opportunity, then you're gonna to go to the back of the line. It's unclear when the vaccine is gonna be available for everyone. The last I heard was sometime around early summer that it's anticipated that it will be freely available to everyone. So what about the long-term effects of the vaccine? The short answer is we don't know. We don't know because the virus has only been in existence for about a year and the vaccine, as far as the clinical trials, hasn't been administered to anyone. The first administration was about eight or 10 months ago. So we really hadn't had the benefit of long-term evaluation of the safety. However, what we do know is that 
there's no history of vaccines causing long-term effects, and there's no biological reason why this particular vaccine uh, would have long-term effects. How, and in addition to that, the long-term safety of the vaccine among those people who've already received it, the CDC is already looking at that. So if you make the decision to be vaccinated, uh, you'll have an opportunity to sign up through a program from the CDC called Be Safe. So you go in, go online to the CDC's webpage, you put in your name, phone number, email address, and what happens is the CDC will send you a text periodically. In the beginning, they send it about once a day, and they ask you, you know, how are you feeling today? Do you have fever? Do you have any symptoms? Based on your response to the text, you might even receive a phone call if you report any unusual side effects. In addition to it collecting that data through text, it will text you when it's time for your second dose, just to remind you. What I can say in regards to the long-term effects, again, is we don't know what the long-term effects will be. We have no reason to believe that there will be any severe or unexpected negative long-term effects taking this vaccine. What we do know is that people are dying right now of the, the virus and the vaccine is our best protection in addition to our prevention as far as hand washing, social distancing uh, that we have. So as Christians, then we walk by faith. We don't know what, it, what the long-term effects are, but we just have to pray and ask God to give us the faith and walk into that faith as we're making the decision about receiving the vaccine or not. So what if you already had COVID? You know, do you need to take the vaccine? Um, there's data to, to suggest that people who have the COVID, that they, there's a period of about three months where they do have an immune response, but we don't know how long and that response lasts. So it might be okay to wait about three months before you take it, but if you have the opportunity to take it, you don't have to wait. You can take the vaccine as soon as you're over the incub of the um, isolation period after having had COVID. You can have a conversation with your healthcare provider about delaying it. Uh, you're getting the vaccine about three months after you've had it. But right now, the, the short answer is yes, you, you should take, consider taking the vaccine. So what about these myths that we've been hearing? You know, my response to all of these myths is just that we as Christians should not lean into our own understanding. So there's myths out there that even suggest that the coronavirus is not real. Um, that myth in particular is, is offensive to people who've lost people to coronavirus. This candle is in remembrance of those people who have been lost to the realness of this virus. There are some myths that say that the vaccine has a chip in it to track you. Well, if you have a cell phone, you can be tracked. So there's no reason to put a chip in a vaccine and there's no data that suggests there is a chip in the vaccine. There's some concern that the vaccine affects your, your DNA, that it could genetically change you. Um, there's no data to suggest that. Biologically, uh, the way the vaccine is developed, it does not enter into your cell to affect your, RN, your, your DNA. There's some belief that the vaccine, that the virus will just magically go away, but there's no, um, based on previous viruses, uh, such as the cold virus, the flu virus, that they just magically disappear. And then there's some concern that there's some bad ingredients in, in the vaccine. Um, if you go to the Pfizer webpage, on the webpage, um, you can see a list of everything that's in the vaccine. 
If you don't believe what's on the web page, you can talk to your trusted healthcare provider. You can talk to a nurse that you're comfortable speaking with and pray about it and ask the Lord to just increase your wisdom and knowledge and your level of comfort and peace about receiving this vaccine. But all of the information about what's in the vaccine and all of the safety and all of the clinical trial data, it's on the Pfizer and Moderna as well as the CDC vaccines uh, websites. So blacks in, in meanwhile are missing the shots. Um, in the state of Kentucky, only 4.3% of Black Kentuckians have received the vaccine. Blacks make up about 8% of, of the state of Kentucky demographics. So that means only about half of those people who are eligible have actually taken the vaccine. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we know that Blacks are hesitant about taking it. And that's not because they're paranoid. It's just because of the way Blacks have been treated in research as well as in the medical um, profession throughout the year. So there's a real reason for there to be some mistrust among Blacks. Additionally, um, there are some concerns about vaccine access. The Black communities simply haven't had access to the vaccine. And there are some things that are being done to address that uh, limited access to the vaccine. But right now, the majority of the vaccine is going into the arms of people with higher incomes and the majority populations of the United States. So what happens? If you decide to take the vaccine, what's going to happen is when you arrive at the vaccine center, they're going to check your ID. They're going to give you a vaccine card. You've probably seen those on social media. They're going to review your well-being, you know, ask you, how are you feeling today? Um, have you had any um, immunizations at all recently? Have you had any serious uh, response to a vaccine in the past? Very similar to the questions that you're asked when you take the flu vaccine. You're going to receive the, see, receive the vaccine injection, and then you're going to be asked to wait in the area for 15 minutes. And that's just to see, to monitor you, to make sure that you're not having any allergic response to it. If you have a history of allergies, if you carry an EpiPen, then the recommendation based on what I told you previously about the review, the safety board halting the trial, because of the lady having a severe reaction, if you have a history of, of severe allergies, you will be asked to stay in the area for 30 minutes after you receive the vaccine. After you receive the vaccine, if you take the Pfizer vaccine, you will return in 21 days or so to take your second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. If you receive the Moderna vaccine, you'll be asked to return in 28 days to take the Moderna vaccine. Whatever vaccine you start with, be it the Pfizer, Moderna, or any of the others that may be coming, that's the one you will take if there is a second dose. So you can't mix, take a Pfizer vaccine first, and then your second shot be with Moderna. It has to be the same. Now, ideally, it's best to try to get the vaccine 21 or 28 days exactly. However, you may not be able to get an appointment exactly at that time point. And the data is suggesting that that's okay. It's okay if it's a few days late or even a, a, up to a few weeks late. But because the clinical trials did it exactly at 21 days or and exactly at 28 days, then the recommendation is to try to get it as close to that time as you possibly can. But don't fret if it's not exactly this on that date. The common effects after the vaccine is fever, chills, fatigue, headache, arm soreness at the injection site, mild muscle pain. And it's been shown in the data that individuals who are over age 65 have these effects 
less likely, uh, less commonly than those who are younger than age 65. So these effects also are more common after the second dose rather than the first dose. But keep in mind that these effects are normal signs that your body is building protection against the virus. So this is common. The body is mounting an attack. So these symptoms of fever, chills, fatigue, that just means that the vaccine is doing what it's supposed to do. Generally speaking, these effects last a few hours to a day or so after the receipt of the vaccine. And among the millions of people who've taken the vaccine, very few have had severe reactions to it. So after the vaccine, can you just go right back to normal? No. You still have to wear your mask, still have to hand wash, and you still have to social distance. And the reason why is that, remember, that the vaccine is effective in decreasing severe infection. It's not, it doesn't mean that you can't get infected. So that means that you could be infected, not have any symptoms and still infect others. So what's gonna happen is the public health officials will monitor the rate of infections after people have received the vaccine. And as the infection rate starts to decrease, they will gradually start relaxing these mandates about mask wearing and, and social distances. And for you, as your bubble, those people in your inner circle, as more of them become vaccinated, then you'll start gradually widening your circle of people that you're, you're feeling comfortable about gathering with. Keep in mind that the vaccine breaches its effectiveness about two to three weeks after the second dose. So yeah, but if you've decided that, yeah, but I'm still, I'm just still just gonna wait and let more people take it. Well, 60 million people have already taken it in the United States. So that's about 10, 11% of the entire population. If you're waiting on herd immunity, know that that requires about 80% of people getting vaccinated. So we're a long way away from herd immunity. Meanwhile, while you're making up your mind whether you're gonna be vaccinated or not, schools are still closed, churches are still closed, ministry is still impacted, people are still out of jobs, people are isolated, and because of that, their anxiety and depression rates are higher, even among children. Family gatherings have been canceled, those great events that we have in our lives, graduations, weddings have been postponed and canceled. No concerts, no plays, no visits to a music, amusement parks. And there are benefits of being vaccinated. We get back to living, lower sickness. We don't have to be concerned about, as concerned about our loved ones being infected or dying from coronavirus. We're back to church, we're back to worship gathering with our family and friends, visiting our loved ones who are in nursing homes, back to recreation, basketball games. We are back to getting those hugs that we've missed. Handshakes, hugging our neighbor, handshaking in church. And that blank is for you to think about what is your why? What is your why, your benefit of receiving the vaccine? So how do you get registered? How do you get in line? In the Lexington area, you can go to UK Health. You can register at ukvaccine.org or you can call the number that's located here on your screen. You wait until your phase is reached. After you've registered either by phone or at ukvaccine.org, keep your eye out for an email 
that will come from UK Healthcare Vaccination. Once you receive that, that email, you, can, you are allowed to schedule your appointment. Make sure when you get that email that you respond quickly because those appointments fill up very quickly. There are also some ongoing mobile clinics in the communities at Bracktown Church, Shallow Community Centers. Those, the sign up and registration for those are site specific. Uh, you can go to those sites web pages or if you're a member of those sites, uh, you'll hear about it there. But those are attempts to address the lack of access in brown and black communities where the vaccine clinics are being set up in those communities so that people who are having difficulty with transportation, et cetera, are able to get vaccinated in their communities. The health department also has vaccines. Um, you can go to the health department's website. You can call them. You can email them at COVID19vaccine at lfchd.org. They have a very informative Facebook page. They're also active on Twitter, or you can call them at the number indicated there on your screen. And in closing, um, I just pray that this presentation was helpful to you, that it answered some of your concerns regarding the vaccine. And I just pray that you continue to enjoy good health um, and that all things go well with you. Thank you again for listening to this presentation. Um, if you have additional questions, you know, feel free to email me at my UK uh, email and my phone number to my office is listed there on the screen. Uh, thank you again for listening. This ends this presentation.